what's feel like after Nancy's read, the ground here's a little hot. <laughs> Step of life. Thank you, Nancy, for bringing the word to life. Amen. I want to start this morning with a story. Uh, this story comes from a book by the Christian author Max Lucado. Some of you perhaps have read Max Lucado. And uh, it was in a book uh, that he wrote a, a while back called Gentle Thunder. The name of the story, though, is The Yay Yuck Man. Bob loved to make people happy. Bob lived to make people happy. If people weren't happy, Bob wasn't happy. So every day, Bob set out to make people happy. Not an easy task, for what makes some people happy makes other people angry. Bob lived in a land where everyone wore coats. The people never removed their coats, and Bob never asked why. He only asked, which, which coat should I wear? Bob's mother loved blue. So to please her, he wore a blue coat. When she would see him wearing blue, she would say, Yay, Bob! Yay, Bob! I love it when you wear blue. So he wore the blue coat all the time. And since he never left his house, and he saw no one other than his mother, he was happy, for she was happy. And she said, Yay, Bob! Over and over. Well, Bob grew up and got a job. The first day of his first job, he got up early and he put on his best blue coat and he walked down the street. The crowds on the street, however, didn't like blue. They liked green. Everyone on the street wore green. And as he walked past, everyone looked at his blue coat and said, yuck. <laughs> yuck was a hard word for Bob to hear. He felt guilty that he had caused yuck to come out of a person's mouth. For he loved to hear yay, and he hated to hear yuck. When the people saw his coat and said yuck, Bob dashed into a clothing store and he bought a green coat. And he put it on over his blue coat and he walked back out in the street. Yay, the people shouted as he walked past, and he felt that because he had made them feel bad. Well, when he arrived at his workplace, he walked into his boss's office wearing a green coat. Yuck, said his boss. Oh, I'm sorry, said Bob, quickly removing the green coat and revealing the blue. You must be like my mother. Double yuck, responded the boss. And he got up from his chair and he walked to the closet and produced a yellow coat. We like yellow here, he instructed. Whatever you say, sir, Bob answered, relieved to know he wouldn't have to hear his boss say yuck anymore. He put the yellow coat over the green coat, which was over the blue coat, and so he went to when it was time for him to go home, he replaced the yellow coat with the green, and he walked through the streets. But just before he got to his house, he put the blue coat over the green and the yellow coat and went inside. Bob learned that life with three coats was hard. His movements were stiff, and he was always hot. There were also times when the cuff of one coat would peek out and someone would notice it. But before the person could say yuck, Bob, Bob would tuck it away. <laughs> One day, he forgot to change his coat before he went home. And when his mother saw green, she turned purple with disgust <laughs> and started to say yuck. But before she could, Bob ran and put his hand on her mouth and held the word in while he traded coats and then removed his hand so that she would say yay. It was at this moment that Bob realized he had a special gift. He could change his colors with ease. 
With a little practice, he was able to shed one coat and replace it with another in a matter of seconds. Even Bob didn't understand his versatility, but he was pleased with it, for now he could be any color, any time, and please every person. Well, his skill at changing coats quickly elevated him to high positions. Everyone liked Bob because everyone thought he was just like them. With time, he was elected mayor over the entire city. His acceptance speech was brilliant. Those who loved green thought Bob was wearing green. And those who loved yellow thought he was wearing yellow. And his mother knew he was wearing blue. Only Bob knew that he was constantly changing one to the other. It wasn't easy, but it was worth it because at the end, everyone said to Bob, yay. Bob's multicolored life continued until one day, some yellow-coated people stormed into his office. We have found a criminal who needs to be executed. They announced, shoving a man towards Bob's desk. Bob was shocked at what he saw. The man wasn't wearing a coat at all, just a t-shirt. Leave him with me, Bob instructed, and the yellow coats left. Where is your coat? asked Bob. I don't wear one. You don't have one? I don't want one. You don't want a coat, but everyone wears a coat. It, 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 it's the way things are here. I'm not from here. What coat do they wear where you're from? No coat. None? None. Bob looked at the man with amazement. But what if people don't approve? It's not their approval, I see. Well, Bob had never heard such words. He didn't know what to say. He'd never met a person without a coat. The man with no coat spoke again. I am here to show people they don't have to please people. I'm here to tell the truth. If Bob had ever heard of the word truth, he long since rejected it. What is truth, he asked. But before the man could answer, people outside the mayor's office began to scream, kill him, kill him. And a mob gathered outside the window and Bob went to the mob and he saw the crowd was wearing green. So, so putting on his green coat, Bob said, well, there's nothing wrong with this man. Yuck, they shouted. Bob fell back at the sound, but, but then the yellow coats were back in Bob's office, and seeing them, Bob changed his colors, and he pleaded, This man is innocent. Yuck! They proclaimed, and Bob covered his ears at the word. He looked at the man, and he pleaded, Who are you? And the man answered simply, Who are you, Bob? Bob did not know. But suddenly he wanted to. Just then, Bob's mother, who had heard the crisis, entered the office, and without realizing it, Bob changed to blue. That man's not one of us, she said. But, but, kill him, <coughs> she said. Kill him. A torrent of voices came from all directions. Bob again covered his ears, and he looked at the man with no coat, the man was silent. Bob was tormented. I, I can't please them and set you free, he shouted over their screams. And the man with no coat was silent. I can't please you and them. Still, the man was silent. Speak to me, Bob demanded. And the man with no coat spoke one word. Choose. I can't, Bob declared. And Bob threw up his hand and screamed, Take it. 
I wash my hand of the choice. But even Bob knew in making no choice, he had made a choice. The man was led away, and Bob was left alone. Alone with his cubs. Does that story make any sense to you? I get the feeling that the guy in that story, Bob, must have been very tired. For it's tiring to take off and put on and take off and put on and take off and put on. It is tiring to wonder, am I being who others expect me to be in this situation? It, it, it is tiring to have a Sunday life and a weekday life. And the two don't look one thing like the other. It, it is tiring to live according to the expectations of the street one minute and try to fit into a world that expects you to show up to work on time or keep a place to live or stay on the right side of the legal system. It's tiring. It's tiring to keep one's vulnerable places under wraps while trying to be the person you think you have to be to be loved. Bob is tired. Bob is burdened and heavy laden for the many coats he's carrying around or weighing him down. Do you wonder who the man is in the story that wears no coat? Is that man Jesus, do you think? Is Jesus inviting Bob to come to him just as he is? Is Jesus offering to help Bob discover the true self? Bob is his best self, the self God created him to be. Is Jesus telling Bob, you can't live your life for all these other people? Even if what they want you to do might be seen as the socially acceptable thing to do, you cannot base who you are on what others expect. You will wear yourself out, Bob. You will run yourself down to nothing trying to please everyone around you. When the man says choose, what is he wanting Bob to choose? Maybe he's wanting Bob to choose the way of unconditional love as the foundation from which he will start. For that, the Bible teaches us, is where new life begins. I think the writer of our scripture today, the Apostle Paul, I think he, he himself struggled to keep his life grounded in that foundation of unconditional love. Do you remember, do you remember how Paul wrote that sometimes he didn't understand his own actions. I don't understand what I, even what I do. Can you relate to that sentiment? What does a life grounded in God's unconditional love look like, anyway? Paul takes a stab at it to try to teach us. He says that when God's love has control of us, our raw impulses, do you get that? Our raw impulses, what some might even call addictions, they no longer steer the bus upon which we're riding. When God's unconditional love has control, we don't do things to harm ourselves or other people. When God's love is in control, we are faithful in our relationships or in street language, we don't sleep around. When God's love has control of us, we don't hoard our possessions and grab for more and more to the point that others have less and less. 
And when God's unconditional love is in control, we are honest in all of our dealings. When God's love is in control, we don't lash out in anger with words that can cut like knives. When God's love is in control, we don't send out tweets or make other social media posts that are vengeful and degrading. For when we live under God's unconditional love, we don't always have to have the last word or force others to see things the way we see them. We can gain our confidence from humbly seeking God's way in every situation. When we live under God's unconditional love, we don't find our security in acts of violence or in collecting weapons of war. You see, when God's love has control of us, our arsenal cannot be found in a gun cabinet or purchased at a gun show. And we're not obsessed with our weapons. For when God is in control, our arsenal are things like truth and compassion and forgiveness and humility. And when we live under God's unconditional love, we stand for justice, yes, and we seek justice, but through nonviolent resistance to the ways of evil in the world. And when we live under God's unconditional love, we honor and we respect those who are serving to try to keep our world of chaos in order, and we show gratitude for their service and sacrifice. When we live under God's unconditional love, you see, we don't divide and label people with artificial categories. We don't dismiss whole groups of people and see them as enemies or threats based on demographic identities like race or gender or economic status or nationality or sexual orientation or religious creed or education levels, for we see everyone as a child. You see, when we live under God's unconditional love, we don't rally others to deepen divisions, but instead we seek to find and promote pathways towards unity and harmony. And when we live secure in God's unconditional love, we choose the pathway of peacemaker. And we do everything within our power to make reconciliation a reality. You see, when we live under God's unconditional love, we take care of the vulnerable, whether it be children or animals or the disabled or those in poverty. We don't turn our backs on their needs. We help bind up one another's wounds. We don't allow greed to have the upper hand and we don't follow the voices of fear. We practice things like generosity and hospitality, and we avoid resentment. When we live under God's unconditional love, we operate under the theory that we all have something to give, something we can contribute to making the world a better and more peace-filled and love-filled place. We all have an offering to bring to the common good when we live under God's unconditional love. I know of only one man over the course of history that has lived totally and completely under the control of God's unconditional love. And today, his image and his name has been so distorted that sometimes I don't think he would want his name used by some who claim to follow him. But the invitation this morning in the words of Paul, the invitation is to put on Christ. In these times, it's hard to find answers to our dilemmas. It's hard to find solutions to our problems, the best I know to do is for us every day to get up, face the world, but before we go out, 
put on Christ. Take everything else off.